فاطمة عوض جيستيشنال تروفو بلاستيك ديزيز I'm sure there is a lot of uh, questions for uh, uh, the speakers, but uh, it's better to, to uh, wait till the end of the session because we are just running short in time. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Our topic now is gestational trophoblastic disease. Um, I just want to remind you uh, what's a trophoblast. A trophoblast is, are the cells that line the blastocyst, and they provide nutrients to the embryo. So they will form a large part of the placenta in the f with the development of pregnancy. So gestational trophoblastic disease are tumors arising from the trophoblast. They may be benign in 75% of cases, and they may be malignant, what we call GTN, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, and we will discuss this in detail. The first, we'll start with the benign gestational trophoblastic disease, and the commonest is, in 90% of cases, complete hydatity from mole. It happens in the extremes of ages, females less than 15 years or more than 35 years of age, and characteristically, beta HCG level is more than 100,000 milli international unit per milliliter. What do we see on ultrasound and on MRI? On ultrasound, we see the classical snowstorm appearance, where there is an echogenic cystic mass occupying the uterine cavity. And on MRI, we will still see this snowstorm appearance. We will see an endometrial cystic mass, like this in T2 weighted images and again, sagittal T2 weighted images. Um, this, um, these cysts, of course, as we know on MRI, they appear dark on T1 and bright on T2 weighted images, but if they contain hemorrhage, they will be bright on both sequences. Because high identity form wall is highly vascular, so in post-contrast study like this image, it will show avid contrast enhancement. Uh, because of the excessive beta HCG uh, is, um, uh, secretion by the high identity form wall, we will find, in 50% of cases, we will find in the ovaries bilateral thick lutein cysts. The second entity in the benign gestational trophoblastic disease is the partial mole, which uh, occupies about 10% of these benign lesions. On ultrasound, it's almost similar to the complete mole, but the difference is that there is a gestational sac with fetal parts. So we find a gestational sac with fetal parts and enlarged placenta with the Swiss cheese appearance, which because it contains multiple cysts. Um, however, we can diagnose in the first trimester that there is a partial mole by the ovoid shape or oblong shape transversely lying gestational sac. And when we suspect this and we measure the transverse diameter of the sac ratio to the anteroposterior diameter, it will be increased because it's lying transversely more than 1.5. The fetus usually, unfortunately, has a problem, a demise, or anomalies, or IUGR. So, uh, as we see here, this is a partial high identity foam wall. Well, we find that the placenta is a cystic placenta, but there is a fetus. And again, on MRI, we find that there is a cystic, uh, the placenta is, is transformed into a cystic mass, but there is a gestational sac with fetal parts. Here, this is the axial T1 image of partial high identity form wall. Well, we can find, I'm not sure if you can see. Yeah, that's great. Uh, some of the cysts contain uh, T1 hyperintensity due to hemorrhage, which can happen. Again, this is a uh, post-contrast showing that the enlarged placenta is highly vascular and it takes avid post-contrast enhancement. Again, this is sagittal post-contrast. Uh, just before we uh, uh, diagnose partial high identity for mole, please put in your mind two differential diagnoses. The first is dichorionic diamniotic twin pregnancy. One of them is a complete mole and the other is a normal pregnancy. And this happens in one per 20 to 100,000 pregnancies. And there is a high risk of abortion or live birth, which happens in 40% of cases. So how can we differentiate between partial mole and dichorionic diamniotic twin pregnancy? One of them is smaller and the other is normal. 
First, that uh, the, the fetus is usually not demised as we expect in partial mole. The second thing is the twin peak sign, which is when the chorionic tissue, as the arrow shows, the white arrow shows, the chorionic tissue dips into between the intertwin membrane between both sacs. So it shows me that these are double sacs, not a single sac. So when we find this twin peak sign, then we know that these are dichorionic, diamniotic twin pregnancies. So one of them is complete mole and the other is a normal uh, sac. The other differential diagnosis for partial high identity for mole is placental mesenchymal dysplasia, where there's an abnormal dilatation of the chorionic vessels in the placenta. So we will find that the placenta is cystic, but these cysts are really, they show what we call stained glass appearance because of aneurysmal dilatation of the arteries and the veins on color Doppler. But the problem is that in early stages, we, this, uh, the, um, the dilatation of the chorionic vessels is microscopic, so we do not have any uh, vascularity in the cysts like this stained glass appearance. So the differential diagnosis is with the alpha fetoprotein. The maternal alpha fetoprotein is increased, and there is no increase in beta HCG level as we see with partial mole. Uh, and with partial mole in 10% of cases, the beta HCG is like complete mole, more than 100,000 uh, uh, mi milli international unit per milliliter. And in most of the cases, it is from 10,000 to uh, 100,000 milli international unit per milliliter. Okay, so this is the differential diagnosis of partial mole. Now, before leaving molar pregnancy, I just want to remind me that molar pregnancy can happen in ectopic sites. It doesn't have to be intrauterine. So uh, complete and partial moles can happen in the cervix, fallopian tubes and ovaries, uh, but they have a higher tendency to rupture and hemoperitoneum at the time of presentation. So the uterus will be empty, but there will be a cystic adnexal mass with or without an embryo. Uh, and of course, as we see here, this is left adnexal uh, complete identity form mole with a cystic mass. Of course, the differential diagnosis is uh, challenging, but the beta HCG level will be extremely high. And we see the peripheral vascularity. These tumors are highly vascular and they show mostly peripheral vascularity. And this is also uh, on MRI, where we find that this uh, cystic lesion, uh, there is no embryo, so it's a complete mole. The cystic lesion contains areas of high signal intensity on this T1-weighted image. The uterus is empty. This denotes hemorrhage. And in post-contrast study, there is a, a avid contrast enhancement. Now let's talk about the most important, uh, the, the more important uh, item of gestational trophoblastic disease, which are the malignant disease. We call gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. The first is the invasive moles. Let us know what's a general idea about them first, because before we talk about the radiology. So the invasive moles are deep growth of the abnormal molar tissue into the myometrium and parametrium. And because they are aggressive, uh, so they call them locally invasive tumors. So invasive moles are locally invasive tumors. Choriocarcinomas are indistinguishable um, radiologically um, from uh, invasive moles, and they also represent invasion of the myometrium and parametrium by the uh, molar tissue, but they are capable of giving distant metastasis, as we will see shortly. Uh, another different, uh, difference between choriocarcinomas and invasive moles is that choriocarcinomas don't have to happen after molar pregnancy. It's just in 50% of cases, but it can happen after abortion or normal pregnancy. The other entities in GTN, gestational trophoblastic neoplasias, are the placental side trophoblastic tumor. I will refer uh, to it uh, later by PSTT, and epithelioid trophoblastic tumors, ETT. The, I will use these abbreviations. So they are rare malignant gestational trophoblastic neoplasias that happen weeks or even years after pregnancy, and where the beta HCG level will be elevated, but it will be just under 100 milli international unit per milliliter, not as much as elevated as the uh, choriocarcinoma and invasive moles. Uh, there is a benign entity of the uh, gestational trophoblastic disease that are uh, deferred here, uh, aside from the high identity form moles, because they are the counterparts of epithelioid trophoblastic tumors and placental site trophoblastic tumors, what we call the placental site nodule. The placental site nodule is considered the benign counterpart of epithelioid trophoblastic tumors. They are aggregates of um, sin C2 and cytotrophoblasts, uh, less than five millimeters in size, um, in a hyalinized stroma. 
uh, if they showed a significant nuclear ATP, this is histologically, and or borderline proliferative index, then they will develop into epithelioatrophoblastic tumors, so they are considered pre-malignant. Another entity is an exaggerated placental site, which is difficult to be differentiated except by biopsy from placental site trophoblastic tumors. And they are still, since C2 and cytotrophoblast, they are invading the endometrium and the outer third of the myometrium. And um, they can happen also after normal molar pregnancies or uh, abortions. Unfortunately, little is, a few case reports are available about the radiological appearances of placental site, uh, exaggerated placental site and placental central site nodules, so we hope, inshallah, in future research we can look for these cases and um, uh, record the uh, radiological appearances of them. So now we, we discussed the benign trophoblastic neoplasia, and we added to them, to the molar pregnancy, we added the, uh, the placental, exaggerated placental site and placental site nodule. Now, uh, the radiological appearance of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is, uh, it's a mass, a, a mass in a uterine mass. It's a non-specific uterine mass. On ultrasound, it could be hyper or hypoechoic, heterogeneous or homogeneous, and it might contain cystic spaces due to hemorrhage or necrosis. On color Doppler, they are characterized because they are malignant by arteriovenous shunting, and so they will show the color mosaic of arteriovenous shunting, and on uh, spectral Doppler, they will show the high velocity, low resistance waveforms. Just remember, and I will show a case now, uh, that these tumors are not classically highly vascular. Few of them could be minimally vascular. Epithelioid trophoblastic tumors, we call them to be usually, but not uh, characteristically similar to fibroids. So they are on ultrasound, well-circumscribed masses with peripheral halos and peripheral vascularity on color Doppler. On MRI, again, non-specific uterine masses, invasive moles, choriocarcinomas, and placental site trophoplastic tumors will appear as so. Heterogeneous, uh, high signal intensity masses on T2-weighted images, and they are highly vascular as evidenced by the signal uh, void uh, vessels surrounding them, inside them, and with marked post-contrast enhancement. But placental site trophoblastic tumor here has another pattern than this hypervascular pattern, which is similar to uh, invasive moles and choriocarcinomas, called the hypovascular pattern, which is more or less similar to the myometrium. I will show you the, the images, so be aware of this entity. Sorry. Epithelioid trophoblastic tumors, again, are uh, similar to fibroids on MRI, so they are of intermediate signal intensity on T1. A low signal intensity on T2 weighted images and with poor contrast enhancement. I hope this video works. Okay. That's a video, but it's not working. I'm not sure why. Oh, that was a nice. Sorry. I don't know, it's not on a. Sorry, this was a video of an invasive mole, which. I'm sorry, sorry, it's not working. I don't know why. Okay, I will see a choreocarcinoma. Sorry, it was a nice video of a nice case of an invasive mole. So, um, a heterogeneous high signal intensity mass at the site of cesarean scar on T2 weighted images. Okay, sagittal and axial. And this is a hypovascular pattern. But histopathologically, it's a choriocarcinoma, but as we notice, it's not intensely uh, enhancing as expected. Uh, the first case was intensely enhancing, but the I'm sorry, the video is, didn't work. And this only shows nodular peripheral enhancement. Okay, so this is the hypovascular pattern that we, or the minimally vascular pattern for the uh, GTNs that we can uh, face. It doesn't mean that it's not a G gestational trophoplastic neoplasm. This is the hypovascular pattern of placental site trophoblastic tumor I told you about, which is different on MRI from the hypervascular uh, pattern that is hardly distinguishable from invasive moles and choriocarcinomas. Here we just find that the myometrius is slightly hyperintense. So this is the placental site trophoblastic tumor. The hypovascular pattern is just iso-intense or hyper-intense to, relative to the myometrium on T2-weighted images and on post-contrast study it shows similar um, uh, enhancement to the myometrium, so it's really a challenging uh, diagnosis. 
The epithelioid trophoblastic tumors, as we see, it's like a leiomyoma, an intragavitary mass that is in, uh, of dark signal or low signal on T2-weighted images. And in post-contrast uh, study, it didn't show uh, enhancement or it showed uh, poor enhancement. Gestational trophoblastic neoplasia are malignant, uh, locally, of course, uh, as we said, invasive mole is locally invasive, and the other uh, others entities are malignant, so they are staged. Um, so the staging of malignant gestational trophoblastic neoplasms are stage one, it's confined to the uterus, stage two, it goes to the uh, pelvis or vagina, stage three, it shows lung metastases, and stage four, uh, other distant metastases. Now, about 30% of the patients with gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, they present with metastasis at the time of diagnosis, and 80% of them is in the lung, followed by the liver and brain, and less common sites are the GIT, the kidneys, the breasts, the bones, and the skin. Lymphatic spread to pelvic lymph nodes, when we find lymph nodes involved, pelvic lymph nodes, then we think of placental site trophoblastic tumors, uh, the commonest to show that. Lung metastases from GTNs are single or multiple pulmonary nodules, so they could be in the lung parenchyma in the form of single or multiple pulmonary nodules that they show, showing peripheral hemorrhage, what we call ground glass attenuation or ground glass halo sign. But they can be cavitary and they can show pneumothorax. They don't have to be metastasizing to the lung parenchyma. The metastasis could go to the bronchi, forming endobronchial masses and atelectasis, or they could be pulmonary embolism, um, embolism to the pulmonary arteries. So as we see here, a chest X-ray and CT chest mediastinal window showing the pulmonary nodules as metastasis from GTN. And this is the uh, lung window showing the peritumeral halo sign, ground glass uh, attenuation due to uh, peritumeral hemorrhage. Brain metastasis, 85 of the brain metastasis, when they happen due to gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, it's with the non-molar choriocarcinomas, not with the molar type of choriocarcinomas. And when we find brain metastasis or other metastasis, we should look for the lung because the lung is usually affected by metastasis. Again, they are single or multiple, affecting the gray-white matter interface, and they show uh, hemorrhage. They are usually highly vascular, and they are um, enhancing. So as we see here, we can find that this is the uh, metastasis from gestational trophoblastic neoplasia with peritumeral edema, and we find hemorrhage inside because this is non-enhanced CT scan. Of course, according to the stage of hemorrhage, the appearance of the hemorrhage will be on T1 and T2-weighted images. And on post-contrast study, we notice that there is an enhancing nodule uh, within the metastasis. Again, a completely hemorrhagic uh, metastasis, brain metastasis from choriocarcinoma, even expanding to the, extending to the left lateral ventricle. Liver metastasis, again, they happen 75% of cases happen after non-molar pregnancy. And they are multiple um, or single, as usual, and they are avidly enhancing. But take care, please, because if you are looking for metastasis from gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, you have to do triphasic CT scan, and you have to look at the arterial phase, not the portal phase, because they show, uh, show rapid washout. As we said, they are highly vascular. So that they will be... They will be detected in the uh, arterial phase, as we see here, and then nothing in the portal venous phase because they washed out all the contrast being highly vascular. So take care of that. Splenic metastasis also act the same. They are seen in the arterial phase, but washout happens in the portal venous phase. So we have to do triphasic CT scan and we have to look at the arterial phase carefully. Now, what is a complication besides metastasis, of course, of uh, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia that we are sometimes uh, mixed up with are for the, is the formation of arteriovenous malformation at the site of treated uh, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. And this happens in 10 to 15 percent of cases. It could be at the time of presentation. I mean, we have the mass, the, the gestational trophoblastic neoplas neoplasia mass with arteriovenous malformation or after treatment. Usually it happens five months after completion of treatment of chemotherapy for choriocarcinoma, but they can, of course, occur after a long period of time, difficult to be correlated, uh, even up to 13 years. On ultrasound, this is a nonspecific appearance. They are just a bunch of tubular structures. And on color Doppler, as we said, they show arteriovenous shunting and color mosaic appearance. And on spectral Doppler, there's high resistance, um, so high velocity, low resistance flow. Uh, 
On MRI again, they are just a bunch of tortuous serpentine uh, flow voids uh, with prominent parametrial vessels. Okay, and they take uh, post-contrast enhancement. Uh, we will see the um, uh, cases now. Um, classically, if we suspect that arteriovenous malformation is a complication of GTN, then conventional angiography is the solution because it will show the feeding uterine artery and draining vein. It will show the nidus. And if the patient has massive bleeding or uh, wants to keep fertility, then transcatheter embolization uh, will be the solution. So as we see here, this is arterial venous malformation following treatment of a choriocarcinoma with the color mosaic appearance on a color Doppler. And it is seen with a bunch of signal voids on MRI. Uh, remember that uh, in uh, diagnosis of arterial venous malformation, we have to do, I uh, prefer to do ultrasound and MRI as complementary because sometimes it's uh, underestimated by one modality and the other one will show it better. So better do both. Again, this is, I'll enlarge the picture. Another case with a mass, um, a, mass a huge uterine mass. The signal voids are not really that uh, obvious on MRI, but we suspected that this patient has secondary AVM associated with the mass. And then when we uh, performed the ultrasound, it was obvious the extensive uh, arteriovenous transformation and the color mosaic appearance. But uh, take care that uh, because if there is arteriovenous malformation, we have to be aware of reading CT scans because these patients will do CT scans for metastasis. Be aware of reading the CT scan because if you found a lesion in the brain, it doesn't have to be metastasis. It could be, um, I mean, infarction. Of course, you know that infarction or cerebral abscess. So take care when you diagnose a brain lesion in a case of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. It is either metastasis, stroke, or abscess because if there is arteriovenous malformation, formation associated with the uh, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, it will cause paradoxical cerebral emboli directly to the brain. But arteriovenous shunting doesn't have to happen in the uterine mass. It could happen in the lung metastasis. And how would we know that? Of course, we will follow the patient after chemotherapy. And if we notice that the pulmonary nodules are resolving or even they are transforming into scars, but some of them are not, then we have to suspect that these nodules developed arteriovenous malformation and do uh, pulmonary angiography to detect the feeding arteries and veins and, of course, to perform transcatheter embolization. Thank you so much for listening. Professor Fatma Awa, thank you very much for this very informative presentation. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, You're welcome. And we'll wait uh, and we'll uh, keep the questions till the end of the session. Okay. Mm, because we're late in time. Uh, and now. Uh,